For tracheostomy suctioning, you need a bottle of normal saline, a trach suction kit, a non-sterile drape to lay across your patient's chest to protect it from the secretions, one clean glove for testing the suction tubing, and personal protective equipment to protect you from secretions. This could include a gown, a mask with eye shield, or a mask and a pair of goggles. I'm going to set these to the side for demonstration purposes, but make sure that you think about protecting yourself when you're performing trach suctioning. Trach suction is performed every two hours and PRN. You do need an order to perform trach suctioning. Before beginning, I've checked to make sure that I do have an order for trach suctioning and I've washed my hands before entering the patient's room. I've also brought something from his chart that has his name, date of birth, and medical record number because my patient's unable to speak due to the trach and I need to be able to positively identify him. You come into the room and introduce yourself. Good morning, my name is Becky. I'm going to be your nurse today and I'm here to do some trach sectioning. May I see your armband first? Allow your patient to show you their arm. And I'm going to compare his name, date of birth, and medical record number against the document from the chart and it matches. Mr. Simon, do you have any allergies? And he shakes his head no. And that confirms what I already read in the chart, that there are no allergies. I've provided for privacy by either closing the curtain or closing the door. And now I want to position the patient so that the bed is at a comfortable working height for myself and that he's in either semi fowlers to high fowlers. If the patient's not conscious, you want them in a lateral position facing you. Before I begin the procedure, I need to do an assessment, and that includes auscultating lung sounds anteriorly and posteriorly, at least six places. Looking at his respiratory rate, his respiratory effort, and his pulse oximeter reading. I'm going to listen to his lung sounds. Mr. Simman, I'm going to lower your gown so I can listen to your lung sounds. When auscultating lung sounds, Never listen over clothing or bone. Take a deep breath in and out for me. And again. And again. And again. And again. And again. Excellent. Now if you can lean forward for me, I want to listen to your lung sounds on your back. Take a deep breath for me, in and out. Again. 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 And one more. Thank you. I hear secretions that are moving in his upper airway that I think we can remove with the suctioning. Now that I've done my pre-respiratory assessment, I'm going to set up my equipment, but first I need to test the suction. I have a portable unit. In the hospital setting, you'll be using wall units, and that setting should be set to 100 to 120. I'll don my clean glove because the end of this tubing is dirty and I don't want to get my hand dirty. And I'll turn on the suction and occlude the end and verify that I do have suction. I'll set this nearby and remove this glove by putting my finger under the glove and removing. I'll leave the suction running while I set up my supplies. Your tray table, because this is sterile, needs to be waist high and clean and dry. I have a new bottle of normal saline. I've checked the expiration date. The color is clear and there's no sediment. If this had been opened, it should have a date, time, and someone's initials. And this can be used for up to 24 hours. If you use a bottle that has been opened, make sure that when you open it, over a trash can or sink, Rotate the bottle as you pour 
and we call that lipping the bottle. My bottle's new, so I don't have to do that. I'll set the drape across his chest to protect it from secretions. And I'll take out the catheter kit. The way this package comes, there's a box tucked right inside the envelope. And the part of the box that's outside is the part that I can touch because it's the part that will go against the table. So I remove it carefully, not touching the inside. That's the part that needs to stay sterile. And I pop the box open so that it can hold the normal saline. I'm careful not to touch the box as I pour the saline in. And I'll set that to the side. Now I'll put on my sterile gloves, touching just the inside of the glove that will be against my wrist. I'll hold the package and put all four fingers in the cup of the second glove, keeping my thumb away so I don't contaminate either of my hands. I'll remove the suction catheter. I want to keep the catheter itself sterile, so I'll keep that tucked in my hand with just the connector sticking out. Now my left hand is no longer sterile, it's just clean because I'm holding something that's not sterile. I'll connect these two. Then I'll test the suction catheter itself to make sure there are no holes. When I occlude this space on the suction catheter, that's what creates the suction. So I'll put this into the normal saline and you can see that the suction is working. In order to protect the tubing from hitting something as I'm moving around, I coil it with my pinky. You can also wrap it in your hand, just so it's not swinging and getting contaminated. I see that his pulse oximetry reading is down to 93%, and when I suction, I'm going to be pulling the oxygen right out of his lungs. So I'm going to hyperoxygenate or pre-oxygenate him by moving his trait collar to the side and putting the AMBU bag that's connected to 100% oxygen on the trach and giving him three to six breaths. I wanna do this with his rate of respiration. So when he inhales, that's when I'm squeezing the AMBU bag. Pulse box has come up, and I'm ready to go down for my first pass. Never cover the suction catheter hole on the way down because you can tear the trachea lining. Keep your thumb off that device on the way down. As I begin to suction, I advance the catheter, and I don't let my right sterile hand touch his gown, the drape, or his inner cannula. I advance until I meet resistance. That's the carina. I'll pull back one inch. Note the marking on the catheter. It's 20 centimeters. From now on, I will only go down to 20 centimeters so I don't keep hitting the carina and causing tissue damage. As I withdraw the catheter, I'll turn it, twisting it left and right, and my thumb goes on and off the suction. That way I won't cause any damage to the tissue. My hand is walking down the catheter so there's not a long piece to come out and hit his chin and become contaminated. I hook this so it doesn't swing around and I return his humidified oxygen to him. With each pass, you can stay down for only 10 to 15 seconds and you must give the client at least 30 seconds to recover. They'll be coughing quite hard and they need to be able to settle down and catch their breath before you go again. So while I'm waiting that 30 seconds, I'll look at the secretions in the catheter. I want to note the color, the amount, if they're thick or thin, and if there's any odor. Now I need to clear those. I see that he has stopped coughing, he's settling down. 
I check his respiratory rate, I check his pulse oximetry reading, and if I need to, I can give him more oxygen at this time. I can see that his pulse ox has dropped to 93, so I'll give him a few breaths. Only using my left hand, which is no longer sterile, it's just clean. Three to six breaths. His rate of breathing. And now we're ready to go for a second pass. Again, my thumb is off the catheter, and I will only advance to the 20 centimeter mark so I don't hit the carina. Keeping it taut so it doesn't hit anything. Down to 20. As I pull out, I apply suction intermittently, and I'm twisting the tube out to clean the trachea completely. Again, I've only stayed down 10, 15 seconds. He needs at least 30 seconds to recover. I'll note those same qualities of these secretions, and then I'll clear my line. It's been 30 seconds, and you can still hear some secretions moving in that upper airway. And I ask the client, does it feel as though I need to go down again? And he shakes his head yes, so I'll go again. My thumb is off the suction. I advance, keeping my hand sterile to the 20. I twist as it comes out, walking my hand down the catheter, and I apply suction intermittently. Hook this, give him his humidified oxygen back. Noting the secretions, then I'll clear the line. Now I'll wrap this around my hand and disconnect. While I still have my gloves on, I'll remove the drape that's got some secretions on it and discard. And I'll turn off the suction machine. If you have wall suction, you can leave it on until the end. That's fine. I'm going to take my gloves off properly by grabbing the outer portion of the glove and wrapping up the catheter within it, pulling that glove up in my hand, going under the second glove and removing and discard. Now I need to do my post-procedural assessment. That includes checking his respiratory rate, and that now has come down to 18. Rechecking his pulse oximetry reading, that now has gone up to 98%. And I need to check his effort, his respiratory effort, and auscultate his lung sounds anteriorly and posteriorly. Mr. Simman, I'm just gonna lower your gown so I can listen to your lung sounds again. Take a deep breath in and out for me. And again. If you could sit forward for me. Take a deep breath in and out. And again. 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 And one more. Thank you. His lung sounds are much clearer after suctioning. If I had gone down three times and he still wasn't doing well, his respiratory rate had not improved, his pulse ox had not improved, and his lung sounds had not improved. I would need to call respiratory stat. They can suction beyond the bifurcation or the carina, and he may need a breathing treatment to open up the airways. I'll raise the side rail, and I'll lower the bed to its lowest position. I'll clean up my supplies and wash my hands. My last step will be to document the procedure, and that includes how the patient tolerated it, what you noted about the secretions, and your respiratory assessment.